All right, let's talk about 5D, the Bill of Rights. It says, analyze how the Bill of Rights serves as a protector of individual and state's rights. And remember, we have to read here for detail. So we're going to have to analyze something here. It's different than describing and explaining. We're analyzing. How does the Bill of Rights serve as a protector of both individual rights and then state's rights? All right, so let's look at some of the background here. The Federalist and Anti-Federalist arguments we've gone over already when, when they argued over ratifying or proving the Constitution, the U.S. Constitution. One of the biggest arguments we did not discuss had to do with the Bill of Rights. <coughs> so the Federalist and Anti-Federalist, uh, the Anti-Federalists argued that the proposed U.S. Constitution didn't do enough to extend protections to individuals or to protect the rights of individuals and the rights of the states. Uh, they wanted a written Bill of Rights to ensure that uh, there would be no misunderstanding and they didn't trust that uh, necessary and proper clause or elastic clause that gave power to the national government. They did not trust inferences in the main body of the Constitution. You know, they wanted an expressed Bill of Rights in writing. The Federalists argue that U.S. Constitution is written provided safeguards already, rights against suspension of habeas corpus. In other words, uh, you know, in times of peace, the government can't throw you in jail without giving you an appearance before a judge to tell you what you've been charged with and a chance to bond out and get an attorney. Ex post facto laws, uh, you couldn't make a law after the fact. Uh, you couldn't. If you were doing something that they thought should be illegal and then they made a law against, they couldn't go back and, and charge you with breaking the law before it was even a law. And then bills of attainder, uh, you know, are uh, b laws that are made that pretty much put you in jail without a jury trial of your peers or punish you without a jury trial. You have a right to a jury trial, in other words. And then titles and nobility were forbidden and then you couldn't tax exports like Great Britain used to do. They said that uh, the U.S. Constitution as, as it was proposed ensured that a Republican form of government for the states and powers not specifically expressed let's change that not specifically expressed as a power to the national government were reserved to the states and the people. Uh, so, and that was an inference there. And they said, we don't trust inferences. We don't trust all these things. We want a Bill of Rights in writing. Uh, the main anti-Federalist was Patrick Henry. And uh, he did not trust the Federalist Constitution. When they met at Philadelphia Convention, he said, I believe I smell a rat. Because he felt like some of the states' rights would be taken away from the people, uh, from the states. And then the individual rights from people would be lost with a new government. So he demands, and the anti-Federalist demand a written Bill of Rights. And the Federalists had to give in uh, in order. And in 1789, they said, what we'll do is after we ratify the Constitution, then we'll draft the Bill of Rights. And uh, James Madison drafts the Bill of Rights. There's 12 of them he drafts, so they will them down to 10. Uh, one of the ones that he wrote originally is now the 27th Amendment. Uh, and we'll talk about that later. Uh, but the first 10 amendments to the United States Constitution, the first 10 changes, when we say amend, we mean to change the Constitution. It's added in 1791, after the ratification of the Bill of Rights, James Madison wrote, wrote them, because the Anti-Federalists uh, insisted on a list of rights to be added before the Constitution be ratified, and then after it's ratified, they, they propose this Bill of Rights, and then they finally ratify 10 amendments to the original Constitution. So the Bill of Rights is going to protect individual rights and states' rights. And this is what it looked like here. It's not a good picture, but this was the original one. This is the aged one that's in a museum somewhere. Uh, the first eight amendments are going to protect individual rights. The ninth one is is basically made because the Federalists argue, hey, guys, look, Anti-Federalist, if we make a list of rights for individuals, what if we don't put a right for the individual that's already in there, that should be in there? What if we leave it out? Does that mean people don't have it? 
<clears throat> and the Anti-Federalist says, why don't we just make an amendment that says this isn't a total Bill of Rights. There's some that may not be listed. So that's what the ninth one is. And then the tenth one basically says whatever powers are not directly and expressly given to the national government are reserved for the states. So states are protected with the Tenth Amendment. So let's run through those. Let's analyze those and see how this works out. One through eight is individual rights. The ninth one says you may have rights that are not listed. The tenth one says states are protected, reserved rights for the states. So analyze how the Bill of Rights is a protector of individual rights. One through eight. We're going to look at that. One through eight and then nine. How does it protect individual rights? The First Amendment says uh, uh, freedom of religion, speech, press, assembly, and petition. And here's some vi visuals I put in here to help you out uh, with that if you want to pause this and take a look at it. But, uh, alright, let's see. The Second Amendment is the right to bear arms. You know, and a lot of people today is very controversial. Right to have guns. And it also means the right to have a militia. Or a standing army in the states. All right, the the third, excuse me, I'm off task here. Let's see. Let's back this up. The first one you can remember by raps, R A P P S, religion, assembly, petition, press, and speech. And you can pause this for a minute and try to put that in your mind. That's a good way to remember it. It's come up with some type of acronym or mnemonic device to help you remember. Religion, assembly, petition, press, and speech. Some of our other teachers say Sir Pap. Sir Pap. They take the S and R and put it together. Sir Pap. P-A-P. -P. It's any way you can use to remember the First Amendment. And you can use visuals too if that helps you out. Whichever way works for you. Okay, and then we talked about this Second Amendment. Let me bring it back up here. Um, the Second Amendment right to, to bear arms. We talked about that. And I got a little silly here, but, you know, sometimes it helps. <laughs> uh, but there's a uh, right to bear arms. Not these arms, but not these bear arms over here, but guns is what it's talking about. It's, it's, uh, there's a lot of arguments about that. Uh, and then some people argue that it was meant to really guarantee that states had a militia. Not really that individuals could have firearms, but that states could have a militia. So that's the second one. All right, the third one here uh, is a right to uh, not have troops quartered in your homes in time of peace. And you know, if you look at these, uh, if you look at these, some of the British soldiers tried to stay in in the, the homes in Boston and quarter there. The British government parliament said they had to be quartered without charge, and they ate food and lived there. And that's some of the Americans didn't like that. They felt they had a right to property, and that was just a violation of their property rights. But the right not to quarter troops in times of peace. The government cannot force you to house soldiers in your home. And a good way to remember that Third Amendment is that an average household has three bedrooms. Okay? Three bedrooms per house, so that would be one forcing. Uh, quartering of troops or housing of troops. Okay, and if you remember, you know, a lot of uh, militias and the, and the British government tried to take the arms from the people. That's one of the reasons the Second Amendment exists. And then the Fourth Amendment if you recall uh, that the Fourth Amendment, the British searched people's homes uh, with those writs of assistance without probable cause. And uh, a lot of Americans didn't like that, thought that was a violation of their privacy. The Fourth Amendment is the rights against illegal searches and seizures. Uh, and we call that the Privacy Amendment. And some people can remember that by thinking of a four as somebody getting frisked by the police with their hands up against the wall. And the Fourth Amendment basically says uh, 
you know, the rights of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated, and no warrant shall issue but upon probable cause, supported on oath or affirmation, describing the place to be searched, the people to be searched, and the things to be seized. These are rights for individuals. These are rights for individuals, and this is the Fourth Amendment here summarized. Rights for individuals not to have the government. You know, these protect the government from infringing upon the individual rights. You know, of privacy, of quartering troops, uh, you know, the right to have guns. And we saw recent constitutional um, challenges in the Supreme Court where the Supreme Court said that states cannot take away people's rights to weapons, neither can the national government. You know, and individual rights to have their own religion and to assemble and to petition the government. You know, we, we saw in the First Continental Congress the Olive Branch petition, the king just ignored it. You know, we saw that a lot of uh, the British government was violating a lot of these, and we see a list of them when we read the Declaration of Independence and went over it. All right, the fifth one is a, is a long one. Uh, the fifth, the sixth, and the eighth are all for individuals who have been accused of crimes. And uh, no person shall be held to answer for a capital or very serious or infamous crime unless a presentment of an indictment by a grand jury, nor shall any person be subject to the same offense to be put twice, to be twice put in jeopardy of life and limb, nor shall he be compelled in any case to be witness against himself, nor deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. And a good way to remember the fifth, because that was a lot of stuff in there, is this acronym or mnemonic device here, Donald Duck Eats Sour Grapes. Remember the first letters, Donald Duck Eats Sour Grapes. And we can break those down into double jeopardy, uh, due process, people have a right for due process of law, eminent domain, you're going to learn about that in civics, the government can take your property, it has to give you just compensation for it. Self-incrimination, the government can't make you get on the stand and incriminate yourself and the police can't make you answer questions without an attorney being present. Uh, grand jury, you have to get an indictment for serious felony charges. Uh, and we see in the Sixth Amendment, another way that I remember the Sixth Amendment is through this mnemonic device. Ignorant criminals constantly seek attorneys, just in case. And uh, some of the Sixth Amendment protections are to be informed of the charges against you. You know, to make witnesses or compel witnesses to testify for you, even though they don't want to. Uh, to confront witnesses who are against you. To have a speedy and public trial, because Great Britain used to delay those uh, until it hurt people who were defendants. The right to have an attorney present. The right to a jury trial of your peers. The right to an impartial jury. And, uh, yeah, this was a good picture here. Is this a fair and impartial jury? You know, a lot of kids get a kick out of that. And then the Seventh Amendment is a right to a jury trial in civil cases, not criminal cases where you've been accused of crimes, but uh, civil cases with $20 more. This was back then. It's a little bit more than that now. And then the Eighth Amendment says, uh, you know, it protects us against cruel and unusual punishment by the government. They can't, the government can't torture us. And then excessive bails and fines. Okay. And then uh, the Ninth Amendment. People still have rights that are not listed in the Bill of Rights. And it says, the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed or understood or perceived to deny or disparage others retained by the people. In other words, this isn't a complete list. People have other rights that are not listed here. The ninth, I try to remember, that's the people, you know, the people's rights. Uh, the nine looks like a little person. I try to manipulate that. Just give you something to remember it by. And then uh, the other thing we're supposed to analyze here is how the Bill of Rights is a protector of states' rights. That's what we want to look at. In the tenth one, we call the Reserved Powers uh, Amendment, or it, it reserves powers just for the states. And if we move this out of the way, it says the powers not delegated to the United States 
by the Constitution or prohibited by it to the states are reserved to the states respectively or the people. And this is a saying that states have powers and all powers not given to the national government are going to be reserved to the states and the people respectively. So that's how the Bill of Rights protects states' rights and individual rights. Okay. So we want we analyzed, we looked at how does the Bill of Rights protect state rights and then how do the Bill of Rights how are they protectors of individual rights. I hope this helps you. Uh, you know, watch the video as much as you want. Good luck on the test.